Hey, how you doing? Brian Kane with the Mental Performance Mastery Podcast. I'm super excited for today's episode with Forrest Griffin. Forrest is a former UFC world champion, Hall of Fame fighter, and he's the current vice president of athlete development for the UFC's Performance Institute in Las Vegas. And Forrest is probably most famously known for his epic battle with Stefan Bonner in the final of the Ultimate Fighter 1 live on Spike TV, which is widely credited as sparking the success of the organization. This podcast, I'm really excited that Forrest opens up kind of the lid inside the mind of one of the UFC's icons. And he talks about kind of how he went from being a nursing major in college to a UFC Hall of Famer, how to battle some of those pre-fight nerves and that nervous energy and channeling that into fuel. He talked about how as a professional athlete, once you start making money, everything becomes more real and you focus more on the outcome of the performance and the passion and the process of the performance. He shares a lot of the life lessons that he learned. One of my favorite stories is his rock climbing experience. And he talks about what happens as an analogy in life when you look up or you look down and neither of them is as good as if you just stay locked in on what your next foothold or handhold is. He talks about how the great ones lose themselves in the details of the preparation, the importance of faking it till you find it in the power of self-talk. We get into compartmentalization and separating who you are in the octagon and outside of the octagon. We get into a really cool conversation about what, how Forrest's career changed when he had his daughter and how routines allowed him to make the extraordinary just ordinary. He talks about it, the bathtub routine and ritual that you would use to eliminate negative self-talk and self-doubt and how really one of the biggest things that he took out of being a mixed martial artist and professional athlete was learning to use failure as positive feedback. He shares the importance of being a shark and staying focused and hunting your next target, your next goal, and something that he recommends all professional athletes when they retire do in that career transition phase, which can be very difficult. And then he shares the importance of failing forward in living what you are teaching so that others will listen to you. Absolute pleasure having one of the UFC's icons and a Hall of Famer, Forrest Griffin. He's entertaining. Uh, he's actually a hell of a lot smarter than I thought he would be, so congrats, Forrest, on that. You fooled everybody. No, but you were great, man. I loved having you on here. Thanks for being with me. I know you're going to love the episode. Let's join Forrest Griffin, UFC Hall of Famer, champion, all-around good dude. Hey, how you doing? Brian Kane, host of the Mental Performance Mastery Podcast, and I'm super excited today to welcome our guest, Forrest Griffin. Forrest is a former UFC light heavyweight champion and was introduced into the UFC Hall of Fame in 2013. He currently serves as the Vice President of Athlete Development for the UFC's Performance Institute. He's the author of one of the funniest books I've ever read, Got Fight. He was a former Georgia police officer before taking the world in the octagon by storm when he first rose to prominence after winning the first season of The Ultimate Fighter. In the tournament finals, he defeated Stefan Bonner live on Spike TV, which is wildly credited as sparking the success of the UFC organization. I personally remember sitting on a couch in my friend Dan Nolan's house in Jay, Vermont, watching the fight being glued to the TV and calling and texting all the guys I know saying, holy shit, you have to turn this on and watch this fight. It's a pleasure to have mixed martial arts legend and former UFC world champion and the always entertaining Forrest Griffin on the show to talk about his mental preparation, life lessons, learned wisdom, and how you can benefit from all the punishment for took and delivered inside the octagon please welcome to the mental performance mastery podcast fighting out of athens georgia by way of las vegas nevada he is the former ufc light heavyweight champion the ufc hall of famer forrest griffin forrest thank you for being here man appreciate you being here thank you brian thank you very much i think i can go now i think i mean you said it all There's, i can't even live up to that no thank thank you for having me a uh, big big fan of yours and i've known about you kind of circuitously for years and it's great to get to talk to you yeah um, on on a on a funny note you you said hey here's a podcast i did with rich franklin i said oh, i'll check it out you know see what i'm getting myself into and you know i've listened to a couple of your more recent podcasts but i said this is you know uh, so it turns out if you've listened <clears throat> dear uh, viewers and listeners if you've listened to the podcast with rich franklin you don't actually need to listen to this one because our stories are pretty similar. Uh, you know, he was like, yeah, it's kind of the every man, you know, I don't have, and I was like, yeah, that's me. That's, that's, uh, yeah, he, he took all the good lines. He took all the good lines. It, it's just funny to hear, uh, you know, to hear how similar we kind of are. It's funny. 
You know, he said a lot of times people are like, hey, were you a teacher? Or they'll say, hey, man, that was awesome when you beat Chuck. And I'm like, yeah, that wasn't me, but thanks. <laughs> and also, we both look like um, Ace Ventura. Yeah, yes. We don't look like each other, which yeah. is it's kind of weird. We don't really look like each other. Yeah, we both look like Jim Carrey. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because you guys definitely have both I've heard been been referenced to as Ace Frontier and looking like Jim Carrey. But yeah, you don't look like each other, but you guys did share some octagon time together, you know, and I think that's interesting having both of you guys on here, uh, having you guys both shared the octagon there at UFC 126 in February 2011. Yep, somebody's Wikipedia works. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then your internet connection is strong, Brian. Yes. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Forrest, it's, let's let's kind of go back to where it all started for you. You know, because I'm excited to to get some of your wisdom. Yeah, here. yeah. Matt, My mom have... and dad met around 1976, <laughs> and that's that's when all you know. I'm told it was a good night. I don't know. <laughs> but so, what 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 made you decide you wanted to get started in the mixed martial arts fighting? Because at the time, you were a a Georgia police officer. Yeah. And you started getting into it. Is that right? No, I, I was already into it. Um, I was actually right before, like maybe a year before that, I kind of found it and, you know, just I'd done some tough man contests and, uh, you know, I kind of thought I could fight like most guys. And, um, you know, the clincher for me was I'd seen like an early UFC from like the 90s, 93, because this, I guess, 99. Which one? Do you, remember, like, do you remember who it was? The I don't know. I mean, I it was it was garbage. It was like, oh my god, these guys are like cliches of each other. Like this guy's got a mullet. It was like, you know, like if you think about ninety three to ninety nine, things were really different. You know. So anyway, I, I thought it was dumb, and then um, you know, some friends of mine said, "No, man, you you dig it, you'd like it." And I was just looking for something to do, like an outlet, and um, you know. I think it was my defensive tactics instructor was like, you'd, you'd love this. And I saw, I believe it was UFC 15 with Randy Couture, Vitor Belfort. And I said, man, that is an actual sport. That is really cool. I want to do that. Except do they have to wear the tighty pants like that? Can they wear like regular shorts? And then, you know, they put the short grabbing rule in where you can't grab shorts. And I was in, but no, I, uh, yeah, I saw it. I said, that's a sport, you know, that's I immediately fell in love with that. I was like, this is the epitome of human competition, you know, um, not to, you know, I don't know how blunt you like to be on your podcast, but when you pass a dude on the street, you think, man, I wonder how much money he makes, or, you know, I wonder this or one of that. But at the end of the day, who could beat who in a fight? You know, I could take that guy. I, take that. And I always thought I could take that guy because I got in a fight with a couple karate guys when I was younger and I won. And when I was, you know, in high school, I'd play basketball and I would lose fights too, but I would fight like grown men sometimes when I was in high school and, you know, thought I was tough. And I got beat up by Adam and Rory Singer the first day of practice. And um, I went to the club wrestling team at UJ and I realized I was not tough nor good at fighting. And uh, that's when I just became addicted. And I was a fan. Of, I was a huge fan of sports. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that in a bit, but to me, this was the most encompassing sport, you know, like all other sports, they're a game to an extent where this is at that point when the football or basketball or, or football prop or soccer becomes so intense that you don't worry about the stupid ball and where that goes and you just fight another human being. So what the UFC has kind of done is just make fighting another human being as safe as it's meant to be and then you go for it. So other other sports you played, you played basketball growing up. Any other sports that we do? Were yeah, you ba wrestling? Were you basketball and football. I didn't wrestle because I'm from Georgia, although I am in my high school's uh, wrestling hall of fame. Um, although we did not have a wrestling team when I was in high school. How does how does that happen? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that, man. <laughs> Shout out Evan Ty, though. Yeah, I love that. Well, Forrest, I'm looking you know, at your, so one of your early fights, and I don't know if this was your first professional fight, but it is the first fight, as you mentioned, that is on your Wikipedia. Dan Severin. Right, Dan yeah. Severin. I mean, you're fighting yeah. Dan Severin, who's a- That was, that was like my fifth fight, but only the third time I'd ever fought, because the first two were tournaments. Um, and, you know, it's funny. You know, they say Evander Holyfield lost like his first three or four matches. For me, getting beat up and just kind of, surviving and, and shutting down a little bit, not performing well, ended up being a good thing for me because it lowered the bar immediately. 
Like not even that, oh, it's all up from here, but it was all up from there after you get your butt beat up by an old man. Um, who's still an awesome guy, by the way, Dan Severn. But um, you know, I I didn't perform well. It's funny, and I just uh it actually helped because I was like, eh, you know, I, I'm better than that. I wasn't even like that worried about it. I didn't get hurt. I was able to go in the gym and train um, you know, within a couple, within a week or so. And you know, I was working. I think I was working full time at that time, you know, as a police officer and I was still in college. So I wasn't that bummed about it, you know? So you're, you were born in what year were you born? 78? Don't worry about that. It's a, it's a long story. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was born very old for my age. So, so 2001, you have your first pro fight. I'm trying to put this into context here. So your first. Yeah, that was, that was fight. like my fifth fight of the year. So, and at that age, you're probably 21 ish, 20, 21 yeah. years old, kind of getting it going. And then you go on an eight fight win streak. Right. And then at, what, say so, sure. at what point did you feel like this, that you could be good at this? And this is something that you wanted to pursue. Like at that time, was it still a hobby for you or were you well, thinking this is something I want to do? Uh, it was actually like my second or third fight, just right after the seven fight, which was a long time, you know, kids today, they didn't realize they're very fortunate. They have the opportunity to compete in a lot of different places all the time. There were only so many shows back then. Right. And then there were only so many, you know, shows that wanted you. There's like 10 UFCs a year, 12 if you're lucky. Maybe you get in one. And there's 12 fights in each, you know, so we didn't pull out of fights as much. Basically, it's like if you missed a fight, you missed a fight. You didn't you didn't get to fight for who knows how long. But no, I actually, this is my cool story. Uh, I quit my job to do a fight over in South Africa because it was over the holidays and you couldn't get leave for the holidays. Um, my shoulder came out pretty bad in that fight. I ended up winning. That's my little story. Like the shoulder was out. I would have quit, but the guy like started kicking me in the head. I was on the ground and I got up and, you know, I ended up trying to tie clinch me out of Anyway, I ended up choking him out. I took the, my forehead and put it on the back of his neck and I pulled my, my dead arm kind of across his uh, throat, like a crowbar. And I ended up choking him out and uh, winning the fight. And then I was like rolling around in pain. And, um, you know, it was funny, too, because we didn't really like the rand to dollar exchange ratio was bad. So what we actually got after was a like a safari, safari vacation. Meanwhile, the whole time my shoulder keeps falling in and out during. This. Like, so we're like doing all this cool stuff and I'm just walking around in pain like, oh, my God, oh, my God. But, uh, yeah, so I went back. I had no job. Um, burned through what little bit of savings I had quickly. And, um, you know, I ended up for about two years, you know, working as a bouncer, sometimes a college student. I would take out loans, student loans just to live on. I ended up shattering my hand before another fight for the King of the Cage championship. I shattered my hand in practice right before that. And uh, that's when I took out like eight grand in student loans, which technically, did you know it's a felony to take out student loans and not use them for school? So I did what you what you do. I committed a felony and I I bought myself a new hand. That's a thing I don't think people know about free surgery. They actually don't give you free surgery in the states if it's not like life saving. So I broke this arm, and uh, I said, "Yeah, you you need a plate. It's a elephant non union fracture." I said, "Okay, cool. Give me a plate." And they're like, "No, no, no, no." So they, instead, they just give you a stack of paperwork to fill out to see if you're indigent enough to get the free. Same thing for the hand. So basically. Fast forward, hard luck story, yada, yada. Two years later, um, finally, I kind of get out of the game. I was like, man, I, you know, I had a good run. I tried. I didn't make it. You know, I'm 26 now. I got to, like, maybe grow up. But the cool thing, if I hadn't shattered my hand or maybe it was broken my arm, I don't know that I would have finished college. Hmm. But, you know, I had, <laughs> I had some free time. <laughs> so I might as well finish those last couple courses and write that paper. So I ended up graduated college, which, was, you know, made, made everybody happy, including myself, was, you know, six years later, you might as well do it. But um, yeah, so I was fortunate enough to get a job back in law enforcement. And, um, you know, fast forward 11 months and 12 days. And I got a call to do the ultimate fight. Last minute notice, I was a replacement for some guy that failed a drug test for marijuana. Thank goodness for marijuana. Thank goodness it was illegal back then. But um, you know, so I, uh, I had like 
think 16 days to decide if I wanted to do it. And um, the department I work for, if you quit at, before working a full year, you were not eligible to rehire and there was no, no way around it. And I had, you know, I had really like struggled to get that second law enforcement job. Like that, you know, I was, I, was, I had no car, nothing, yada, yada. Um, I was, I was on food stamps. I didn't even figure out how to use them, but uh, yeah. So I ended up getting the, um, getting the call to do the show, dropped everything, went and did the show. Um, at the airport, I called my lieutenant. I said, man, you know what? I think I might have messed up here. I'm in Atlanta at the airport. I, can I like come back and unresign? And he was like, yeah, you know, and I said, all right, well, hold on. And I called the producer of the show and somehow I ended up talking to Dana White on the phone. Now here's the thing. I couldn't hear a thing he was saying because this is 2004. Do you remember cell phone service in 2004? It wasn't great. <laughs> So I can't hear anything he's saying. And so I was like, ah, ah. so I, you know, and, and just like, I decide like in the end, one, that I want to go train with Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell and see what it's all about and see yeah. how yeah. I compare to that level, right? And then two, uh, it's better in life to regret the choices you make and the chances you take than the choices you don't make and the chances you don't take. And so, you know, pretty, I thought it was pretty sage wisdom for a kid of my age, got on the plane, win the ultimate fighter, yada, yada, yada. So you're, you're that close to never even showing up to the ultimate fighter show. Mm -hmm. You're that close to going, eh, I'm, I'm going to go away. back to the, I'm going to go back to the yeah. department. Yep. Yep. Put everything I own in storage. You know, I had, a, I had like a decent setup in Augusta. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, it's like, well, you get that opportunity now. A lot of people, uh, guys especially, take that opportunity and they have a wife, a kid, dependents, whatever. I didn't have any dependents. It was just me. I didn't have anybody, you know. So it was not a, you know, nobody was, yeah, nobody was dependent on me. I was still young enough. You think that decision would have been more difficult or a different decision had you been married with kids like you are now? I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Would not have done it. I mean, but there, there's... I don't know. I mean, it will it depends on financially, you know, maybe if my wife was a big time lawyer, I would have done it. Right. It's like, well, baby, you got this. You, you could pay the bills. I just got to leave for like eight weeks. I'll be back though. So, you know? so take us inside the ultimate fighter house. Cause I've worked with a, quite a few guys that have gone through that process. Yeah. It's been one of the most difficult things. So first done. off, we did it for 61 days. They, they shortened it to six weeks when they figured out what they were doing. Um, 61 days yet I fought like nine days apart and I only fought twice on the show and it was there three times. It was like, you know, right. Bang, bang. It, it was just, it was like one of the few times I can ever say that I didn't love fighting. You know, it was just weird. It was just, there's nothing else. There's no, there's no break from fighting. It's always like in your face and the people you're going to fight. And it's just irritating. And I just started to go a little stir crazy. Hence the shave of my head and whatnot. We got a surprise guest on here tonight for yeah, that's my daughter, Ella. She want to hop on the podcast too? Yeah, I mean, you know, she's got some great stories. She's got some wisdom. Is she still there? She want to hop on? No, no. Is that right? What's up, Ella? Ella, can you hear me? Oh well, no, she's she's up now. She's getting stuff. She's just I'm in I'm in I'm again. Well, you guys, the viewers probably didn't see this, but we're actually in. Uh, her crafting room. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a guest in this room. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to ask her what her favorite part about her dad is and see what she'd say. Ella, yeah. what's your favorite part about me? Um, you me with Khan. Uh, well, then I helped her with Khan Academy yesterday. Nice. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I don't want to brag Brian, but I'm, I'm pretty decent at fourth grade math. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, I mean, you did get that college degree, you know, you got yeah. that college degree and then you noticed that it was 61 days, not 60 days when you're in the yeah. Ultimate house. Yeah, I was and counting. Then, I was counting. Then, Cause every day was, every day was torture. Oh, uh, and then it concludes right with, with the first, I think it was almost like the first live UFC fight on spike TV. Yeah. It was only the second one ever that had been won on the best damn sports show for Fox that nobody knows about, but I was a huge fan. So I watched it live. So you, and then you and Stefan Bonner get in there. Right. And it, and it's, 
And I, you know, I remember watching the fight, as I, thought, I mentioned earlier in the intro the, to the podcast, I'm sitting on a couch, at my buddy Dan Nolan's house in Jay, Vermont, and we're watching this going, holy shit, you know, and both you guys get the contract and one of the best, most storied fights in UFC history, maybe the most iconic fight. You know, how has that one day, that 15 minutes in the octagon with Stefan Bonner, April 9th, 2005, how has that one day completely changed your life? Well, I can't, I can't overestimate it. You know, it, that's the day that everything changed. And I knew it that day. I didn't know how big it would be or whatever, but I knew that I had my goal. I didn't have to, I wasn't a part-time fighter anymore. It's the first time I knew that I was now a fighter, which <clears throat> ironically came with a whole new stress before. Like when I was telling you, I lost to Dan Sever and stuff. I was a part-time fighter, man. I was doing the best I could training after work, before school, yada, yada. I was working nights, you know, trying, trying to train in the middle of the day, you know, so I had the excuses. And then it was like, oh, guess what? You know, excuses now. You're a professional fighter. That's all you got to do. One thing, get, get better at fighting every day, you know? So, so that was the moment I knew. And that's kind of when it got serious-ish for me. <clears throat> so you, so you win the ultimate fighter, right? You come out of the, out of the show. And then is that when you moved and made the move to extreme couture in, in Vegas? No, in I, I was still, I was still bouncing around for a couple of years. I would, uh, you know, one of the reasons I came out to extreme couture, we were talking about this and kind of like the pre-interview is um, Randy Couture actually asked me to kind of help him with one of his fight camps. And I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. In. <laughs> so, yeah. So I came out and I was training with some guys at the combat club at the time. And, you know, there was just good training out here and there was great training back home. And, you know, there's there's pros and cons to everything right here. Out here, there was a lot more better sparring partners, moves you'd never seen. But back home at the hardcore gym with Adam and Rory, I was the show. I was the guy like the practices were set up to help me. And is there what's 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 the give and take there between, you know, you go to a place like TriStar Gym, right, where George St. Pierre at the time is a UFC champion. And he's kind yeah. of the main guy there. But there's a lot of really good fighters that are there. Maybe not, you know, when George is in a training camp or if you're at Extreme Couture and Randy's in a training camp, you might not be getting all that individual attention that you might get if you were you were that guy. But what's the balance there that you would recommend to like young fighters that where they're comfortable, they're home, they're at a gym, they're the main guy, but they maybe don't have the training partners, the sports science, the environment that they might get if they went to a move to Vegas and went to the to the Performance Institute or, you know, went to one of the more well-known gyms. What would be your advice to guys in making that decision? That That's a huge consideration, right? And that's a decision. And if you're getting what you need back home, then you don't necessarily need to improve. But if you consistently need better sparring partners, uh, better training partners, then you have to make that move. Again, though, you're not going to be the focus. Like back home, and what I did for a couple uh, camps is I actually just flew people in and paid them to come stay with me and train with me and live in my crummy apartment. Uh, a couple of them that end up being future UFC fighters, ironically. But, um, you know, uh, you know, it, it's a balance. And you hate to leave your your original coaches, right? Because they're your friends and they're the ones that help you get there. Think about me. If it weren't for Adam and Rory, I would have never made it as a fighter, let alone I don't even know if I made it in life. You know, I was I had nothing. I was pretty much destitute because I followed the dream of fighting, broke my hand, broke my arm, yada, yada, you know. And um, was living on those guys' floor. And and it was actually Adam that was like, yeah, you should try it. Try it out. Go. Go try it out, you know? So he was the one that, that you know, told me to try it out. And I ended up, oh, wow, I liked it. And I ended up staying. So also, there's no state tax in Vegas. And another thing, I met my wife out here, too. So Beautiful. Beautiful. The, you know, so so that that one day, right, that in, in the octagon with Bonner, the tough, you know, ultimate fighter one finale. Changes changes it for you. Now you go and and you're you're recognizable. You're probably walking the streets. People know who you are. Like, how does the demands on you, you know, change when whether it's that fight or it's your your continued rapid ascent in the UFC, winning a UFC title? Like, how how does your mindset and the demands on you change as you become a more recognizable public figure and celebrity? Yeah. So we we were kind of talking about this, and I was telling you like. Believe it or not, I've never really gotten nervous before fights. I mean, I got nervous, but I get nervous like when you're going to go fly on a plane. You know, I get more nervous on a roller coaster, like in line for a roller coaster than before fighting in the early days. Because I was just like, hey, I want to fight, make, you know, some money and 
then I can go back to being a cop. But this isn't my regular job. I'm going to teach defensive tactics. I'm just going to do this as long as I can. At that point, there was some point in there I realized, hey, you you really have a shot at this. Like you you have an obligation to take yourself as far as your ability will take you. And um, then I started putting more pressure on myself for better, for worse. And that's when it, you know, it, it got a little more difficult for me. You know, money, money makes everything a little more real. There was that aspect of it. There was, you know, yeah. So, I mean, to me, that's the way I looked at it. I mean, yeah, there's, there's temptations, but you know, nothing feels as good as winning a fight. Not that I've done a lot of drugs, but I don't think they're as good as winning a fight. That's the best drug there is. You, be, you talk to people that win fights, and I'm sure you have. They'll be like, did you sleep? No, I didn't sleep last night. I won a fight, played in the World Series of Poker the next day with zero sleep. Couldn't sleep. It was just too wired up. Like, what were you doing? I don't know. Yeah. So, this before Netflix, I was watching, like, cable TV because I didn't know what else to do at a hotel. Yeah, you know? Winning a fight is a high that you can't buy, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's a great way to put it, yeah. And, it, and uh, you know, so you talked about, like, like, you start putting more pressure on yourself. Right. And as, yeah. as, as money starts making things more real, like as you go through your career, what, what are some, you know, whether it was, whether it was pre-fight strategies in, in the championship fight against rampage Jackson, or, you know, when you're, when you're in there, um, you know, as you're, as you're starting to ascent, ascent to get into a title contention, what are some of the mental game strategies for us that you used in preparation for fights uh, or, or to manage the lifestyle that was your lifestyle, being a celebrity that you feel like would be beneficial for our listeners and things that they could use for whether it's a college baseball yeah. player who's listening to this preparing or, you know, someone who's preparing to give a presentation at their at their corporate office. Right. What are the strategies that you now know as an MMA fighter and world champion that you feel like would be beneficial for your daughter, for her friend, yeah. for anybody? Well, I've got two and they're in the book you mentioned, so I don't need to tell you them, but I will. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, first off, I didn't believe in like mental skills or sports psychology or anything. Um, you know, I just thought, I honestly thought shame, shame to say now I realize how useful it is, even in getting the most out of a practice, right. Setting yourself to be in the me best mental space to enjoy the practice, to learn from it, to get the most out of it. I didn't realize how much there were to mental skills. I thought it was literally like that guy's afraid to fight. That's why he needs a sports psychologist. I had no idea there were so many strategies, visualization, like all these things, you know, Randy Couture. Yeah. You were, you were talking about the lemon thing. And I was like, Oh my God, I've done that with him. I'm such an idiot. He's like literally talked about the lemon to your mouth waters. I'm like, Oh, that's amazing. But so and that's the first thing at the time I, I wasn't a, a fan or a believer, but I did figure out a few things on my own. Um, one is that when you're in a fight or preparing for a fight, and this is, again, just another way to say what's already been said a million times, um, be here now. There's nothing you can do about the future or the past. So the way the metaphor I use is rock climbing. I rock climbed once and I saw that uh, that free whatever. Free solo. Free solo. Yeah, I saw that. So I'm an expert on rock climbing now. <laughs> so I think about it like rock climbing, you know? Um, three points of contact, you're looking for your next handhold, your next foothold, that's it. If you look up at the top of the mountain, it's daunting. You'll never make it. I'll never be a champion. You'll give up. If you look down, it's terrifying. You, you're going to die if you fall. You can get really hurt doing this. This is not a safe sport. People's legs go all bendy, uh, you know, gumby all the time. Like that could happen to you. So you look for the next handhold, the next foothold. And in a fight, before I could find my zone, my rhythm, my flow, whatever it was, I would always put myself together and just lose myself in the details. Now, they'll say if you're in a fight and you have to think about what to do next, you're too slow. You've already lost. But I think that thinking about what you're going to do next, as long as you're doing it, you know, fast, boom, boom, my hands here, my hands there, it'll start coming. You know, you hear people say, fake it till you feel it. Well, my mom had a good one. She always say, Oh, now that's what she said. Fake it till you feel it. People say fake it till you make it. My mom said fake it till you feel it. And if you try that, it actually works. You start, you know, she also said if you have to ask her, honey, it's a no. But we'll go with the fake it till you feel it one. Yeah, you know, so 
Well, and it's funny you mentioned fake it till you feel it. There's a, there's a great clip of George St. Pierre on, on the high ESPN highly questioned yeah, yeah. where he fights Michael Bisbing. And they say, George, do you remember when you went from feeling not confident to no, and now you are confident. And he's like, confidence is a choice. He's like, when yeah. I'm in the locker room before the fight, I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to be scared. There's going to be self-doubt because I know what's at stake. Like, you know, the reality of what you can lose if you lose. He goes, <laughs> but when I leave the locker room door and I start walking to the octagon, I will fake it. And by the time I get there, you know, I'll be in my routine. I'll hear my music. I will have watched the highlight video to my music. I will have a transformation that when I get to the octagon, I'll feel more confident and ready to go. And there was a great clip on Mike Tyson in a documentary where he talked about being in a locker room and being terrified and like, he would just, he would literally fake it and act. And when he got into the ring, he would act like he was a God, you know, and he would never yeah. take his eyes off of his opponent. Are there any strategies specifically that you used around body language and kind of faking it till you, till you become it? Absolutely not. You know, I was the most genuine and honest. So my thought on that was, <clears throat> I don't care. I don't care about you. We're fighting. I don't care. There's not, I don't, I'm not trying to intimidate you. I'm not trying to not be intimidated by you. You are, you know, to me, because the fighting is a violent thing and you can hurt people, I don't care about you. It's, it's com you know, complete sociopathy. It's not that I want to hurt you. I just don't care. It's me or you, so it's you. Um, so I just got my, my own mental house in order. And then I figured, you know, that that's all I need. So I was never, you know, you get, you get anxious. There, there's a crowd. But, but the thing I always come back to is, and I identified this early in my life. Oh, man, my stomach feels weird. Yeah, it does. Because you don't need blood in your stomach right now. It's shutting down because digestion, not the most important thing right now. Everything feels like it's in car accident speed, like slow motion or something. This is weird. Yeah, it's weird. That's your nervous system getting ready to do what it, it knows it's time. You know, your, your snake brain knows what's going on. Your snake brain's been doing what it's been doing since you were hunting woolly fucking mammoths, you know? You you have it in you to survive. You, you know, when it when it when it goes down, your body is getting ready for that. You know, and that's why you get so exhausted sometimes. You see guys get so tired in fights. It's because they're so wound up. So that's where like the mental strategy is like just, you know, uh, arousal modification kind of come in. You don't want to be too aroused. You want to, you know, you want to have that perfect level of arousal. Yes, you should be excited. You should be nervous. There's a lot of chemicals flowing through your body. That's a that's a good thing. If you're not nervous, well, that's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, it, it'll get you it'll get there after the first guy hits you or something. And that that's what I'll tell people when they're struggling. Like, you know, hey, I'm I'm nervous. Yeah, you are. Cuz you know this is a big deal. You you've trained for this for a long time. And, and the other thing I would say, I think it's in the book too is, you know, just know two things. You won't quit on yourself and you've done everything in your power to prepare yourself for this moment. Once you do those two things, there's really not a lot you can do. And it's funny. I, I can do that with competition more than I can do that with life. Now, don't get me wrong. There were times I was not super confident in my own preparation because things had not gone well in my sparring right before the, the fight or something. But, you know, that's a valid concern. You know, I, I got knocked out in training, you know. Forrest, were there, were there ever times where, you know, I've had, I've had guys that I've worked with who have said that they, they felt like they lost the fight before it even began. You know, whether it was, say, you know, and GSP's talked about this, the first fight with Matt Hughes, the first fight with Matt Sarah. Uh, I've had guys say like they're in the locker room and they just, they just don't feel like they can get it going. Like they literally lost the fight in the locker room. Did you ever have an experience like that? No, no, I had I had a fight where I was fighting Jeff Munson, who's who's a name, um, and, and you know it was, it, was big, it was an opportunity for me. It was a big opportunity for me, and for whatever reason, I think I maybe worked at a club the night before, like bouncing, in, and then I had to drive two hours to the venue or whatever. And uh, man, I could not get going. I just could not physically. I couldn't break a sweat. I couldn't warm up. I have this elaborate routine, warm up routine that I would do. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of, of routine, of doing the same thing. I, for me, the routine is what gets me through. The routine is what makes the extraordinary ordinary for me. So I, I need to dial in. I need to do my thing. And I just couldn't get going, like to hit mitts, to do anything. I was just, 
my body just wasn't cooperating. And that's the only time I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But by the second round, he was as tired as I was of beating me up. So I ended up, I ended up picking up the second, third round from him after he beat the crap out of me in the first round, you know? I never did get going. <laughs> I just I just let him slow down to my pace. It was crazy. And you end up, you know, winning that fight by decision. The, yeah. the you know, so you thought about not being able to get it going and having the routine. I've never heard someone say it that way, that the routine is what makes the extra extraordinary ordinary. Yeah. Talk about I mean, I'm, ripping, I'm ripping Hoosiers off. You know, <laughs> I was a 10 foot, 54 feet. Yep. All that stuff out there that's bigger, that doesn't change the octagon. The octagon is 30 foot or it's 25 foot. The canvas, is the, the padding's two and a half inches. The canvas is made out of canvas. The fencing's the fencing. It doesn't change no matter where you put it. The altitude might change. The, the humidity in, in the air might change. The time you're fighting might change. But, you know, those are all things that will affect you, but really nothing outside of that octagon or a cage is going to affect you at all. The crowd, the noise, of this, that. It, it will if you let it, but you can't let it. How do you, so you now, now in your position, right? Working, working with the, the Performance Institute, right? Is you, you are kind of now in a mentorship role to, to fighters. And I'm sure you see all different mentalities from fighters, from people that have lost a fight in the locker room before they get caught on things they can't control. Like in your experience now in the position that you're in, what are some of the commonalities that you see, like common mistakes that you see fighters make from a mental preparation standpoint? You know, what I see a bit, and I don't do sports psychology, but I, I do more like a, honestly, I do logistics. Like what's the best way to train to get the best out of all these things that we provide, et cetera. But the, the thing I do see, if somebody's not doing well in one area, they're training the this, the that, then their sleep, their relation, they'll, they'll sabotage everything. So what I used to do with a diet was, it, I used to look at it this way. Look, if your car gets a flat tire, you're not going anywhere. So you might as well get your gun, get out and shoot the other three tires out. <laughs> that was always, that was my mentality. You know, and you can see it's that, that destructive downward spiral. I see that a lot. I see people, they don't want to, and this is a little bit what I'm talking about when I wasn't a full-time fighter. They have that excuse in their back pocket. I didn't try as hard. I, well, you know, I didn't really prepare as much. So they're a little bit maybe intimidated or one thing isn't going well in their weight or their training or, you know, their wrestling, takedown defense, whatever it may be. And they let it, they intentionally undercut the rest of their performance so when they get in there it's like well i it's the kid that didn't study for the test the smart kid that doesn't study for the test because if he never tries he never loses you know like oh i didn't study so yeah i got a c but you know or d i but i didn't study so it's okay yeah i mean i lost but i barely prepared for that fight if i'd have prepared and things have gone well in the beginning so just because things, one thing doesn't go well, you cannot shoot the other three tires out. You can't let it circulate and become this thing where or this aspect of training, this training, so this training, my relationships, everything, the, the way you deal with your coaches, everything kind of falls to the lowest level of your one problem. Now, if you have one problem, you have to raise your, your communication with your coach, your 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 recovery, your lifestyle, your your other aspects of training, right? So, but that's not human nature. Human nature is when one thing's bad yeah. to pull everything down to it. But obviously we know, uh, hey, this is bad. So we have to make these things better. Because you know what? That fight's still coming in two weeks. It doesn't matter. Mm. And, and you know, I, I'm able to, to tell people this, not because I'm smart, not because I've, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm able, because I have perspective. You know, it's just anybody can do this. It's just the outside view of a person. You know, I, I talk about coaching. Like I coach a lot of people on their technical skills and I am not a great technical fighter by any means, but I have perspective. I can see that your foot isn't where you actually want it to be or where you think it is. And that's all it is, right? I can see 
that you are self-sabotaging every other area because one area of your training, practice, preparation, or life isn't where you need it to be. Yeah, being able to compartmentalize, right, different segments and saying, okay, well, this is my wrestling training. This is my jujitsu training. This is my stand-up training, whatever it is, and compartmentalize yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But I would almost, I'm going to almost put it like this. Look, if something's bad, you better make everything else better. Hmm. You know, that, that compartment is going to affect you. So, but if you get your head right, get this right, get that right. And, you know, and, and we talked about this a little in the pre-interview. Get, getting to be around a guy like Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell for a smaller amount of time, but getting to see like that champion mindset, that competition, that mentality, the way he always referred to it as competing and put himself in the best possible position to win. No matter, you know, I, honestly, that guy's body, like Bisbing is another one. Glover Teixeira is probably another one. These people, they're so god darn mentally strong. Their bodies had already to an extent quit on them, but they were able to, you know, with their mind to drive on, you know, and Frankie Edgar's another one. Like I think, you know, physically he's he's kind of deteriorating, but mentally he's he's too tough to ever think about like quitting or stopping or not fighting the best. You mentioned being, you just mentioned some of the best guys, right? Frankie Edgar, Chuck well, Liddell, Randy. Yeah, Cooper. I mean, I'm, I'm a tough dude, but when my body broke down, as it did pretty early, my, my mind broke down, which isn't to say that that's wrong. You know, you like, oh, I'm fighting with one arm the last three years of my career. I knew it, but I wasn't so mentally strong as to work on other things or to change my game. Well, to, you know, to double down on that mental strength. So I was just average tough. These guys are super tough. Right. 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 What's uh, t- talk about some of the camera characteristics, right? You talked about the Frankie Edgars, the Chuck Liddell's, the Randy Couture. Yeah. What are in, in now you've seen, you've been around, you know, a hundred, a hundred UFC champions, maybe not that many, maybe 50 you've come across in your life. Right. And whether it's you yeah. fighting, training with them, working with them now in, as a, in the, in your role with the UFC. Is there any characteristics, commonalities you see amongst the people that have become UFC world champions, one of which you are, and the guys that don't make it? Is there any separating factors, whether it's a, yeah, physical, that, you know, a training mentality? Like separating mental. There's, I mean, there's physiological factors. There's even a background to an extent. How did you start? How did you get into the sport? But yeah, I mean, there, there, there is, yeah, as far as mental character, I wish you would have asked me this ahead of time. I would have researched, I would have given it some thought. That's a really good question. It deserves a really good answer. I don't have one. Let me see if I can make one up on the spot. Um, Let's turn it. Let me see. Let's turn the page. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. (laughs) I I mean, again, 95, 95. The people I mentioned, the people I mentioned, they had extraordinary mental toughness and will, will to compete, will to do things better. Uh, And I'm sure you've known guys and gals in the gym that were gym fighters, we call them. And I'm sure you've known guys that would, bat 400 in practice but when the game came it was like to to save their life they couldn't touch the bat to the ball right you know and and i think you know the the ability is just to to translate it and i don't you know it's it's a hard thing to describe you're probably a lot better at describing it than i am it's that intangible i know it when i see it i know he's a guy or gal that can turn it on when it matters here's here's a funny story about myself um somewhat related to it as far as, you know, nervousness, competition, whatever. I was pretty decent in basketball. I was damn near mediocre had I really. <laughs> but um, I, uh, if it was a very close game in the fourth quarter, fourth quarter, I didn't want the ball. Mm. I would go up, get the rebound, and then even if I was two feet from the basket, I would look for the guy, like, where's the open man to pass this to? I got to get this ball out of my hand, you know? I did not want to let the rest of the team down. Uh, football, it wasn't so bad, you know, because, it, you know, it's just different. But in basketball, there was definitely, if it was a close game, the fourth quarter, I did not want to be the LeBron, the Kobe, the guys that strive to get that ball at the end of the game. You know, I was the opposite. I was like, let me find this opening up. He looks open. <laughs> let me get this right out of my hands. And, you know, some of that is, hey, look, I'm not the best shooter. I know my role. I'm, I'm going to catch a rebound, like play a little in the paint. And then I would do, in the games that we either lost big or won big, I would have my best games. Mm-hmm. I would score the most, do the most, you know. And so that was a little bit, uh, you know, that team mentality that I didn't really get. And that's one of the things I found in fighting that I loved. 
you're not beholden to anyone. If you get beat up, you get beat up. Yeah, there's a guy on another side of the fence screaming at things that it's been helping you out. But at the end of the day, he's not going to get punched in the face or getting his arm broken, you know? You are. So, you know, it's it's really just you. So that was something I always loved about the sport. I thought I'd throw that in there because I didn't have an answer for your better question. <laughs> you know, Forrest, early on the podcast, you mentioned you were going to drop some wisdom tonight. And in your book, which I recommend anybody who's looking for an entertaining read and wants to laugh, uh, the book Got Fight, Forrest Griffin, one of my favorite, just hilarious books, you know, just take a look at the mugshot cover, but there's, there's th- things in here, you know, that, uh, that, uh, as funny, as funny as it is, there's a lot of things in here. I think that, that are wisdom that can be applied to everyday life. You know, what are some of those principles that you take from martial arts that you apply to everyday life? Like you talked about the, the concept of, of compartmentalization and about routine takes things that are extraordinary to make them ordinary about faking it till you feel it. I mean, these are things that you can use in any day life. Is there anything, yeah. else, anything else you mentioned visualization, anything else that you feel like was important to you in your career that you, you could take, you know, and use in everyday life. So our listeners could go, I can try that. Well, well, it's funny. I, I, um, I found these things on accident and only now do I study mental skills. You know, I'm, I'm, I got to write a section in our new, uh, uh, we call it the journal, but the, basically the UFC PI manual is 480 pages. I got to write some mental skills section that, you know, with, with all the, you know, we talk about the visualization, mental imagery, uh, all those things. And, and now I get them and, and how effective they can be in improving your practice and your life. But one that I came to uh, pretty early in my career, because a lot of times in fighting, you'll lay in a hot bath in an attempt to lose some weight, right? You just you start sweating. Once you get the sweat, well, that's why I used to do it. I would work around plastics until I start sweating. I keep the, the room very humid, you know, and then I would just get in the hot bath <clears throat> as hot as you could take it, maybe just a little hotter. And I was sitting there <clears throat> and you're going to have negative thoughts. They're going to creep into your mind. And I know you're supposed to identify them, take them out or something. But I had in my head <clears throat> that there was a way to not let mental thoughts come into your head to immediately replace them with positive thoughts. So what I would do is I would go ahead and I would almost like feel sorry for myself in that hot bath because it sucks a little bit. And it's something you do before every fight. So I would lay on the hot bath and I would think of every bad thing that could happen to me. I could do this, I could do this. Potential mate I'll ever have was going to see me get beat up. You know, you got knocked out in practice. You got this. I think every bad thing, every, every, you know, negative thing that desired to pop in my head, I just go ahead and I'd never speak it out loud, but I'd go ahead and you'll never hear me say I was afraid and nervous. It's just not, it's just not something I want to do, but I would let that come out and I would let it sit in the hot water. And then I would just open the drain and I'd let, let every negative emotion thought, and sometimes there weren't even thoughts, just feelings. And I would visualize them in my own head. Everything bad is going down that drain. And I would let the water until you're like, you kind of feel silly because now you're in a dry tub laying down. Hey, what? But you, you let everything bad go down. And then you, you get up, you stand up, and you take a nice, cool, not cold, but cool, refreshing shower, you know, to stop the sweating because you sweat as much as you need to. And then I would just feel that cool water. When you're hot, it feels great. You know, so you're like if you do the cold shower thing, it's not so bad if you get out of a sauna, right? You know, you do the hot, whatever. Um, and it, it felt great. And I just, you know, I, I envision that as like the positive energy, the positivity, the good things like falling down on my head. And, um, you know, that's kind of how I would do it. And <clears throat> if I were to do it again, I would incorporate some breathing into that sort of thing. You know, that's a great way to, to trigger your nervous system and get the results you're looking for. And, you know, yeah. Love that. It'd and be I, cool I, if I said all that on mute. I mean, yeah, no, we got you. You, you muted yourself there. <laughs> the, uh, you know, Forrest, now, now in your role, right? Anything, anything that you do, did like, you not like my bath? Did you not like imagining me in a bathtub? No, I, I didn't like the, I didn't like the idea of 
the water going down the drain because I thought that you would just live in the negativity, that you'd want to keep it with you, that you'd, you're a guy that would want to keep that with you, that you probably would take it and you'd rehydrate by drinking the negative. I would drink the bath. Yeah, like you'd bath have the bad stuff go in the tub and you'd say, hey, we got to put this into an IV so I can pump this back into me after the weigh-ins so that I can yeah. bring the negative back uh, into my soul. You seem like that kind of guy. but the, God, uh, You know me well. Wow. You're, you're pretty good at your job because you, you got me pegged in like 30 minutes. That's not that's not unimpressive, right? Is there and then, you know, so t- t- let's talk about the transition out, right? So, so yeah. you're a UFC world champion uh, at the time. Let's actually talk about that fight for a moment because you know you win the title against the guy who at the time is on a damn tear in Rampage yeah. Jackson, right? I mean, he's he's come over to the UFC. He's be- beat Chuck Liddell, beat Dan Henderson, unifies that with the pride belt, whatever that means at the time. Yep. But he's like the baddest dude on the planet, right? And now you're getting in the octagon with him. Is there any intimidation? Is there any fear? Or is this like you going in the octagon knowing, no, this is my night, dude. Like, I'm going to be a UFC world champion. Yeah, it's funny. So that that's one of the first times I ever got, like, really nervous. Like, you know, before it was kind of like whatever. That was, whoa. No, so that was that was one of the first times I ever got nervous. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So there I am, like, before the fight, like, oh, boy, oh, boy. And I tell you what, I came out a little stiff. I mean, I'm stiff, dude. I'm a stiff dude. I'm, you know, I'm. Uh, well, besides Cowboy, I'm one of the stiffest fighters I'll see. He might even be more cardboardy than me. But, you know, I came out really stiff. And um, one thing I've always said, and I've always found true, is, you know, Mike Tyson said everybody gets a, has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. Well, my plan was always to just go out and get hit in the mouth and figure it out from there. And Quentin Jackson was nice enough to oblige and hit me right in the mouth really hard. And that's just kind of when it, like, it all came on. I was like, okay, all right, I got you. I'm cool. I got this. And that was, um, you know, that, that kind of set it right. But but that was the moment I was like, just telling myself, and I don't remember it that well, but I, I think the point I was telling myself is like, hey, once you get in there, when, once you get going, it's going to it's gonna be fine. It's, everything's going to be fine once it gets going. This is just a weird thing you're having right now. Who knows? You slept on, you had too much coffee, you know, who knows what's going on. Once you get in there and get going, Again, you've done this a lot. Your body knows what you're doing. You're going to start doing your thing. It is okay. And one thing I was really good about was never, uh, I think, I forget who pointed this out, but I would never say rampage. I would just say, yeah, I'm Mr. Quentin Jackson, you know, Quentin Jackson. And, you know, I would just use people like the name. And I never let my opponent's amazingness get in my head. Never. Um, you know? And I would just, like, you know, I would just call people kind of by their name instead of like this or that, the nickname too. But yeah, that was, that was kind of the first time that I was ever like, wow. Man, man. And then that's kind of what I told myself is, look, man, you put the work in, you know, get in there, do your thing. It'll be all right. You know, so so the, what you're mentioning there, right? A strategy is like talking to yourself, not listening. Like you're telling yourself, yeah. you don't feel right. Maybe you had too much coffee. Maybe you had this. But when you get in there and contact is made, you've done this for a long time. You've gotten in the cage before and not felt yeah. great until you got hit in the mouth and then you started going, right? So like yeah. the mentality of talk to yourself, don't listen, but also understanding that anticipation is worse than participation. Oh, always, always. Right? Unpack that for us a little bit. Like, I think a lot of times people think that when they're nervous or they're anxious before an event, whether it's a fight or it's a meeting or you're speaking somewhere, there's yeah. nothing wrong with them. And it's like, no, man, that's just part of the ticket to admission. Like, that's part of well, the that, process. Yeah. And it's a good thing, man. That's what I was trying to say earlier is it's a good thing. That means your body's like, oh, this is a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal, which is cool. Th- these are the moments like when you're nervous before something, that means it matters. That's the kind of stuff you're going to remember, man. For better, for worse. So to me, that's that's a good thing. Like jumping out of a plane, getting a fly in like a crazy F F sixteen with the Thunderbirds. Yeah, I mean, they, they were like, uh, so I got to fly in an F sixteen, and they're like, "Are you nervous?" So I was like, "No, should I be?" And they were like, mm, "Not, no." <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. This guy, this guy's done this a thousand times. I'll be fine because I'm with him." You know. Um, T- take me through the F-16, man. I've seen the Blue Angels. I've never been in a plane like that, but I've seen the Blue yeah. Angels fly a bunch. What was that like for you getting in there? Oh, man, it was awesome, you know, and it was <clears throat> sometimes uh, you talk about people that do psychedelics, maybe. Sometimes you get a little in your own head and you just want to shake the snow globe a little bit. And I was really looking forward to that. I wanted to I wanted to 
go through the emotions and get scared and get this and get high and, you know, all those things that come with something like that. Because I want to shake the snow globe, you know. It's funny how stuff like that, um, I was looking forward to it. Like, I was, like, Jones to go. I was like, you know, life's life. You can get in a bit of a rut. This is a great way to shake the snow globe and find out what's what's important to you. Like, you know, um, if you've ever been on a plane that you thought was going to crash, you you have like a couple moments of clarity where you're like, man, you know, my wife, my kid, my family, what's really important, what's not. Um, you know, people after big losses, you see, you know, a loss shakes the tree and lets all the dead leaves fall off, the stuff you don't need. That's not a bad thing, you know. I, and, and that's what I love, too, about mixed martial arts in general is like, the best have lost. The best, Randy Couture has like eight losses. People lose all the time. The best in the world have lost. I mean, Conor McGregor loses every fight. And he's still awesome, right? You know, it's like it doesn't matter so much. You're not being judged even on your win and losses. You're, you're judged on how you perform a little more, you know? And, and I, I love that about the sport. So, yeah. You know, Forrest, let's fast forward here from, from you know, you win the fight with Quentin Jackson. Um, and then, you know, you still have a career, another four years fighting a who's who of, of UFC, you know, world champions and Rashad Evans, Anderson Silva, Tito Ortiz twice, Rich Franklin and, and Shogun Hua. And then you retire after that fight with Tito Ortiz in July of 2012. What was the transition like for you? You know, where, did you retire on your own will did your body break down? What was it like for you at the end? Yeah. So I already had one arm, more or less. My, my right arm was done. I have to get a shoulder replacement at some point. You probably meet a lot of pitchers like that in your line of work. But, yeah, so, you know, I'm already fighting with one arm. But that's okay. I want to do it. I love it. And at this point, uh, and I don't know if this is the right or wrong thing, but it was the right thing for me. I've already decided that I'm never going to be champion again. I had a great camp before that Shogun fight. I didn't give – I did everything right, and I got knocked out in the first round. Hmm, it happens. I, I was like, yeah. You know, what What would I do differently? And well, I could change a few things, but it wasn't like, for the most part, that was a, that, I mean, I did what you should do to win fights. I, you know, and I've, I'm learning, I'm trying to get better. I'm working with, you know, people in my reaction, my coordination, you know, I was doing all the right things and I was still doing all the old things that I've done and incorporating new skills. And I just, you know, kind of said, Hey, you know what? I enjoy fighting. I would love to fight other old people with big names. So I had no intention of retiring. You know, I was actually supposed to fight Phil Davis uh, that Christmas. And 21 days before the fight, I was defending a takedown. You know, I had like fresh guys shooting on me. <clears throat> I was defending a takedown and, you know, some guy was just really eager to get me down. Well, he didn't get well, he got me down. But, he, you know, my knee tore ACL, MCL, meniscus. Um and then, you know, I was just so frustrated, so angry. I was like, I'm done. I never want anything to do with sport. I hate it. I hate it. Um, you know, and, and for me, I hate I hate not working out. I hate not being able to, to train or do something, you know. So it really sucked. And then about eight months later, I was in physical therapy, and I was, like, doing foot ladders with these high school kids. And I was like, I'm moving pretty good. And <laughs> so I just made a call that I was like, hey, I'm 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 not retired. I'm coming. I'm coming back. He's get something ready for me in about three months. I'm going to be ready. And um, <clears throat> I was playing soccer with some five year olds, and you know what? But they were like really good five year olds in my defense. <laughs> and I was trying to show off, and I tore my uh, my MCL off the bone. And here's the, it was just like the park, like walking distance from the house. So my knees torn out, but we'd played a long time that day, and uh, my daughter was like, you know, four at the time. It was like, Dad, don't you tell me? You got to carry me. So I got to carry her back. <laughs> I try to carry my daughter home with like the, the torn knee and then I, you know, I, I get it kind of stabilized and I go in and they're like, yeah, you need surgery again. And then I was like, all right, now I'm really done. So, and, and that's something too, you know, and I'm sure you've seen it probably a lot of guys. I don't know how many guys you, you work with that have, you know, kind of retired from the sport. But I know guys with, you know, millions of dollars out here in Vegas, you know, millions and millions of dollars, like real money. And they're still like kind of searching for something to fill that void that for me was eight years in the UFC, you know, and they're still like, you know, kind of kind of missing that. And that's I got very, very lucky that I got to continue in the sport in a different, you know, in a different avenue. 
Um, you know, and in the beginning, I still wished that I was fighting, not doing what I'm doing. But now I've, I've been doing this for, you know, I've been working for the UFC for eight years, which is how long I fought in the UFC. So now, you know, I've totally transitioned into that. And now I want, you know, a lot like what Rich Franklin said, I want to look forward, not backward. Like I want to do things for the sport and for the fighters in the UFC that advance the sport. You know, I want to make contributions to it on the other side of it now, you know? And I think that's something that, you know, kind of like listening to Rich that really resonated like, oh my gosh, that's what I'm trying to do every day mm-hmm. is grow the sport, work, have, you know, basically, yeah, I had some great accomplishments. I did some good stuff. I was, I was in the right place at the right time a lot. And now I'm doing the same thing again with the Performance Institute. You know, I tell you what, man, it, it's, it's like luck being, you know, the, the, you know, luck is like, uh, what, what is it? You know, hard work and timing. Yeah. What is Preparation, it? Preparation opportunity. An opportunity. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, it's the same thing. I just keep getting lucky and ended up in the right place at the right time. And then I just keep working, you know, day by day, just try to work. What can I do to, to get to this goal? And, uh, you know, it, it, it's gotten me where I am now. You know, I think there'll be a lot of people listening to this for us that are in that place that you yeah. talked about, right? Like they, I like that. A lot of people listening, hopefully more than read that book. Yeah. Well, though, you know, it, it is, it is a New York times bestseller just in case people were wondering. Sure. First book. I didn't know. Well, you, I didn't know you wrote a book. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot to do that, but go yeah, ahead. New York, sorry. Times, New York times bestseller. Let's go. But the, but the, uh, there'll be a lot of people listening to this that are in, in a place like that, right? That transition period where yeah, their no. baseball career, they're, they're at their best at the top of their game and they get released. Pro sports is not your forever job. They fall off the cliff. Right. You fall. Some guys retire. They're right off in the sunset. Most of them fall off a cliff and now they go, holy shit. Now what? And you were able to transition into another role in the UFC. Now that you've made that transition, if you could rewind the clock eight years and grab the Forrest Griffin, who's just, who's, whose professional athletics career just came to a close, what would you share with that guy? Or what would you share with the people listening to this that are in that period of transition going, Shit, everything I've done my entire life as a professional golfer, baseball player, fighter, or whatever. Now I got to make a transition. Whoa. What would you share with me? And, and it's hard too. It's like, you know, what do you do when you've already had your dream job and you've timed out of your dream job? Like I grew up as a kid. I didn't want to be an executive at the UFC. They're like, oh, well, I really want to sit in an office and help fighters. Like, no, I want to sit in an octagon and beat people up. So um, you have to reprioritize. You have to find new goals. Again. Uh, when I speak to kids, I say, be a shark. Don't, don't be a fish. Just be a shark. Be moving towards your next meal, towards your next target. Immediately, when your career stops, what do I want to do? What do I want to be good at? What's my next great passion? And hopefully you have enough money to set yourself up to, to buy a little time so you can figure out what it is you really want to do. But I, I'll tell you another story. Like, So I started college as a nursing major, and I was like, and then I found, well, I found out I, I wasn't very good at chemistry or calculus. So I quickly changed my major. And then, so I, you know, I went to law enforcement. I'm like, this is awesome. So I wasn't, even though I failed, I would say I fell forward. Mm-hmm. So I, I always learned from whatever it was I was doing and course corrected, you know, hey, if I'd have been really good at nursing school, I never would have found any of this. I never would have found a defensive tactics instructor who said, you should do this UFC stuff or anything like that, you know? So, uh, you know, things do happen for a reason if you, again, work hard and and even if you don't know exactly which direction to go, working hard and heading in that direction is the right thing to do until you realize, oh, this is this is actually what I need. You're going to find forks in the road and things are not you're not going to end up where you thought you'd be. I'm not where I thought I'd be eight years post retirement at all. But, you know, that's that's. I mean, that's, that's a bit of like a life, what it hands you. And then the best way to take advantage of that, again, moving forward, falling forward, being the shark and finding what it is you're after and going towards it. Otherwise, if you, if you're not headed anywhere, especially if you have money and a little bit of notoriety, you can really do some harm to yourself, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What, what, what's the advice you give people? You do that professionally. I want to hear your advice. You know, is I think it's identify first. What are the things that made you successful at what you did? Okay. When we get past, like, you know, when you get past, 
I could transition, you know, from stand up, I could take a guy down or I could transition into the guard really good or, you know, or into the mount really good, or I had a good, you know, I could, I could, I could, you know, change levels really good, whatever it is, sports specific shit, right? Is let's, once we get past that and we get into, well, what are the other things that made you good? Well, I was really committed. Uh, my work ethic was off the charts. Yeah. I surrounded myself with good people and I saw out knowledge. Like you went from Georgia to Vegas to work with Randy Couture. You took a risk and a gamble on yourself and went from the comfortable and what was known and what was safe and what was consistent of the job as a police officer. And you rolled the dice on Forrest and you went to Vegas to the ultimate fighter, right? You're, and so you start looking at past the superficial, I don't say superficial, mm-hmm. past the surface level specific yeah. skills, but into I'm really good at being 6'3, 200. Yeah, points. right, right. Really good at you get into the character skills in terms of like what made you good, and once they identify those, and we write them down so they can see them, so we're not talking, but we're not we're not you know talking the talk, we're walking the walk. I put it down so you can see them, and I go these skills right here that made you a world champion or made you a professional yeah. athlete. You take that and roll it into real estate, roll it into business, yeah. roll it into entrepreneurship, roll that into coaching, roll that into parenting. These are the skills that make you successful. Yeah. These are the skills that fed your athlete development. So now take these same skills and let's identify what you want to do. And let's go, let's go use those skills in that that's, direction. That's awesome, Brian. That's awesome. I will throw one caveat in there though. Yeah. Um, those skills worked for you in fighting or in whatever it was because you were passionate about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, you put the work in, you were committed because you love the sport. Or yeah, I mean, in our case, it's the sport, right? You love the sport, and that's why you were able to, uh, you know, to use that commitment, that drive, that determination, that whatever, you know, mental resilience. You know, I, I talked to a guy who's like a kind of a famous movie star, you know, and he he has the ability to get laughed out out of an audition a hundred times and not lose enthusiasm to go in the hundred and first time, and that's what's going to make him successful and anything he does. Whereas, you know, I've been in those audition rooms and being like, Oh, geez, this isn't going well, you know, but my my point is you, you have to find something that you're passionate about to bring all those skills forth. Right. You know, there's another book, I think that Forrest, that was a New York times bestseller, not to be confused with got fight by Forrest Griffin, but it was a book called good to great by Jim Collins, right? It's a business business book. And one of the things that Jim Collins talks about in that book, and I'm going to paraphrase here, he calls it the hedgehog circles, but I call it living in sin and, uh, and, and S I N strengths, interests, needs, what are your strengths? So good. You could be best in the world. And that's that list of character traits say that we came up with yeah. fed the sports skills, right? What are your strengths? What are your interests? This is what you're talking about with passion. Yeah. So what are your interests? My interests as an MMA fighter was, it was, it was competition, right? Okay. Well, you can compete in other things too. It's just different than the competition inside the octagon. It was being in a spotlight. Okay. Well, we can put you in a spotlight too. If you want to be a speaker or you want to be yeah. you know, a face of an organization somewhere, like we can find those things that you like and you're interested in. And then you look at the end, which is what does the world need? What so much that they will pay you for. So we look at what are your strengths? So good. You could be best in the world. What are your interests? So good that you would pay to do it. And what does the world need so much that they would hire you for your expertise? If we can find that overlay, that that living in sin, that place where your strengths, your interests, and the world's needs come together, shit, then you become world class and unstoppable. That is awesome. I'm, you know, I don't even have to read that book now. That's yeah. a good book, though. I yeah. like that book. <laughs> yeah, but you steal that. But that's that's the thing we no. try to do, right? So I look at like no. for myself, what are you know, like strengths, interests, and needs, and I feel like I found that with mental performance coaching, and then it's oh, yeah. what I want to do. It's what I'm interested in. It's a strength because I think I've I've. I've been an athlete and I've been around great athletes at different sports and, uh, and asked a lot of questions and been the dumbest guy in the room very often and found out what is it that people do that makes them successful. And even like interviewing podcasts like this, like this is my laboratory. This is where I get to learn. And then what does the world need? The world needs people that can, can help synthesize and take strategies from greats like yourself that they can use in every day. Forrest, I loved what you talked about with failing forward, you know, and if you want to be a shark, swim with sharks, not goldfish. And And I've heard people say that, but you gave it the next level, man. You said a shark is someone who is headed where they want to go. They know what their next yeah. meal is. They know what their next target is. And they're going to yeah. love that. Love that. Um, a question for you. It was a guy who's got his first kid coming in a couple months. Oh yeah. How does happen? Thank you. You know, you, you, you win a UFC, you're in a UFC fight on a plane later that night back to see the, yeah. the, the birth of your first child. Yep. First and only. Yeah. How does, that, that how, how does having a child how did that change you in your career? 
Well, it made me a wuss. No, it, it definitely increased my ability. To, I thought <laughs> there's like a tie black. I was like, oh, I didn't think that was funny. <laughs> no, it definitely uh, increased my ability uh, just to have empathy mm. for others. And now I like kids. Before I didn't, I was like, take it or leave it. I had a lot of friends that had kids. And I was like, yeah, we'll play with your kid. Uh, now I'm like, oh, let's play. So um, again, it, it's going to be amazing. Like, again, it's just like, a little bit like the fight advice. Like once it happens, you're like, yes, this is where I'm meant to be. This is amazing. And my wife was even worried that like, maybe, maybe I'm not like a great father or whatever, or I was worried that maybe I wasn't going to love it, but you look, you're, it's like performing. You're, you're genetically predispositioned. The second you see that child, it, probably even now it becomes the most important thing in your life. And you can't really explain it to people that don't have a kid yet, but once they, you know, once they see your child, once you see your child, like, okay, this is what it's about. This is why I'm here. I have to make sure that this thing survives and does well in the world. And it's, it's awesome. It's definitely a purpose. It's, it's a passion. It's all the things we just talked about. And, you know, oh, we were talking about, like, I was worried, maybe I won't be a great parent or whatever. My wife was like, hey, you love pets, though. You know, you love pets. You're at least tolerable to other people's children when they're throwing up you know you think babies are cute you're all right you don't have to like oh well i don't have any you know i don't like grow up with like siblings right so i'm not like whatever but yeah i mean it, it's it's amazing and the one thing you know my daughter's already eight so she's halfway out of the house mm. spend as much time as you can just the time right there's no substitute for time and i think how old are you 43 43, you young man. I'm 44. Were you 77 or 78? 78. Okay. 77. <clears throat> but yeah, you um you realize too, a kid really defines because you start thinking about like, well, my daughter's gonna get married and I'm gonna go to her marriage and I want to dance with her at her wedding. And you know, I I want to see her grandchild. And you really start thinking about how. Life is life. The things we accomplish are great. Money's great. You got to have some of it. But, you know, the most important resource is your time. That is by far the most important resource. And having a kid for me, put that in line, right? Because I like to work. I have a cool job, right? Like I like to watch fights and study and, and learn about sports science and sports psychology and all this stuff. It's a great job. But at the same time, I also need to be around my kid. And the more you're around your kid, the more you want to be around them. I was very, very fortunate when I had my daughter, I was still fighting. And then I would just, you know, I, I got to basically spend every afternoon between the two training sessions with her. So it was really, really good for me. Um, and then even when I was laid up, I was laid up on and off for a year with the, the knee surgeries, you know, the better part of a year I was, you know, laid up. I couldn't even make it upstairs. And she would, you know, bring me ice packs when she was like four. Right. You know, which is just awesome. Right. Um, and yeah, so you're, you're going to love it, man. It's gonna, you know, it's literally, it's what you were on this earth to do is make a child. And so you're just going to love it. It changes everything. It's awesome. The one thing I was going to add, um, first, yeah. I mean, so how you feel about that dad? Good. Yeah. It's uh, the, the, the piece about time is your most precious resource, right? I, I agree with that hundred percent. puts it in perspective though. Yeah. You can get more money. You can get more fame. You can get more success. You, should, you ain't getting more time. Nope. Where is that time going? And then, you know, are you being intentional? Like I always, when I, when I work with one-on-one -on -one clients, right, I'll always say, Hey, you got a lot of goals, right? Yeah. 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 And they start talking about their goals and I go, okay, show me your calendar. I said, if, if yeah. that is important to you, oh. how come 80% of your, you know, if I look at your calendar, now let's color code this and guess what? 80% of your time is in work and 5% of your time is into family. So don't tell yeah. me the family is a priority for you because it's not lining up that way. Yeah. But if we look out over the next couple of months, maybe there's a block where there is, but it's just what it, it's not an exercise for me to tell you how much time should go into family and work. It's an exercise to build awareness, to go yeah. what you're saying, aligning with where your time is going. I, I was speaking to a high school football team. Very similar. And I said, hey, take out your phones. Oh, wait, you got them out anyway. Thanks. I appreciate it. you know where I was going with this. And then I was like, look how much time you spend on Instagram. Look how much time you spend on YouTube. Look how much. Now, now don't, you know, I had them write their five top five values down. And I said, you know, does what you're putting into that phone 
is that does that align with what you say your values are? If not, I think you need to re-examine your values, you know? And that's, you know, again, like your calendar that your your phone tells you how much time you've spent on X, Y, and Z. That's why I have the time limits on all my social stuff. Um, but but the one thing I, I did want to say is that um, you're talking about talking to me and getting to talk to people. Um, I actually sought you out. You know, I, I, I was like, I basically invited myself on your podcast just because I wanted to hear some of the cool stuff you had to say. You know, I wanted to hear some of the sage advice. I wanted to get like, you know, I want to get a free session in. And I think I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good at that. But no, it's like a, a genuine compliment to you. You know, I've heard you around. I think I heard about you the first time, maybe with GSP. But that's, I mean, if, if we're being honest, that's back when I thought, what's wrong with that guy? He's so good. He's a sports psychologist. Weirdo. Uh, yeah. And, and, said, and, and maybe now looking back and going, oh, maybe part, maybe part of oh, what yeah. made that guy so good was he was tapping into this aspect of training yeah. that most people didn't even know yeah. existed. I could have gotten so much more out of it. Yeah. You know, and you think like being around Randy as much as I would. Yeah. But he just had those mental skills from somewhere. I think he learned them actually in, in the years of wrestling at the Olympic Training Center. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, my, my, we, we mentioned about this in our, in our kind of pre-podcast interview deal we did where um, UFC 74 Couture, Couture versus Gonzaga, yeah. you know, and I'll actually I'll play this clip for you because back then, you know, I would buy all the UFC DVDs after the fight would come out so that you could see like the behind the scenes footage. And this was my first yeah. UFC where, you know, I was cornering George for that fight with, against um, uh, against Josh Koscheck. And then this this video came out afterwards. And it's kind of the behind the scenes, Couture Gonzaga, and listen to him talk about the mental game here for us. And I feel like every athlete, especially UFC fighters, should see this video because it is it is Randy Couture back in 2000 and I think seven, basically giving a, a huge aspect and a huge glimpse in his mental training. Let's take a look. Well, the visualization exercise that I do a lot is, and it gets more regular the closer the fight gets. Uh, a lot of times after practice, I'll lay and and just relax and visualize the situations and the technique that I'm trying to imprint. Uh, visualize the fight and how I see the fight going and, and my demeanor and, and how it's going to be walking out. I, I know what the arena looks like. I know what the cage looks like. I know what color shorts I'm wearing. I know what my opponent looks like. I can see all that stuff just like watching a, a motion picture. And you have a physical response to the pictures that you put in your head. So you put positive pictures in there and see things going the way you want and you feel good and you feel relaxed and you feel in shape and you feel intense. At the same time, you're calm and, and collected and, and all those things that you want to occur and in the course of that evening of the fight. You know, so there he is talking about kind of like everything, that, oh, all the stuff he does from a mental performance standpoint, right? And the visualization and using all the senses and seeing what it's oh. going to look like, what it's going to feel like, like, this is this is 13 years ago. He's talking about using visualization. Man, what a stud! And I got to kind of mentor under that guy, and I didn't even pick any of that up. What an idiot! I've actually heard that clip before. Yeah, and yeah. So you know, there was a lot to pick up from him. I remember him working half guard top on me, like with that ground and pound, and then I remember him finishing Gonzaga with that. I remember him throwing that inside kick he threw to Sylvia to the overhand right, drilling it again and again, and joking with someone, oh, does he have a tie fight coming up? Is he fighting more tie soon or something? You know, like, um, and, and, and you know, so I was picking up the technical aspects of what he was doing, of how he was training, but I wasn't necessarily picking up the, those mental aspects, you know, those, those, you know, he, Randy was a, a great teacher in that, like, he was a leader. Like he did it, but you had to be smart enough to follow him and on the physical stuff and on the way he, he prepared his body. You know, I remember, I remember when that guy was in the gym doing the uh, adjustment stuff. Um, you know, I followed him, but I didn't, I didn't catch up on the mental stuff in time. Yeah. What a, what an awesome dude. Interesting. Cause at, at that fight, right. I remember, I remember it was, um, we were getting ready to go to the post fight press conference. And I was actually in the bathroom right there beside before the outside of the press conference room and, and Randy's in there. It's just Randy and I were sitting there washing our hands before the meeting, you know, and I was like, Hey man, congrats on the win. And then I asked him, I said, Hey, you know, I was, uh, did some work with George for this fight. And, you know, I was, I was actually looking up some of the stuff and reading some of the stuff you talked about from a mental game perspective. He's like, did tell me about, tell me about kind of what do you do from a mental standpoint? And he talked exactly about the visualization. 
He's like, you know, when I, when I was with the wrestling and the national team, we would train a lot and I, we would always have to practice lay down on the mat and we would visualize the technique we were trying to use and what we were trying to do and see ourselves taking it into a competition. And he actually mentioned you, he goes, you know, now I got all these young guys in the gym and guys like Forrest and these other guys, you know, it's hard to keep up with them and the, the amount of volume that they're doing in training. So I want my training to be shorter, uh, more, more like, you know, more uh, competition, like more game, like more, 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 you know, specific. And then I'll visualize after training to kind of get some more mental reps. I thought that was awesome. And he, he did, he did give you a shout out there in the bathroom there at the Mandalay Bay saying, I can't keep up with guys like that. that are so young going hard all the time. Yeah. I would, that man. Yeah. That was pretty, I mean, and, and, you know, when he did that, he's like 40 something. <laughs> right. You know. He's like, all so right now, dude. He's yeah. I mean, so sad, and, got right? COVID and he's in there winning fucking UFC championships. I know, man. So, so, so amazing. You know, I mean that, you know, that, I, so I used to compare myself to people like him and Chuck and be like, man, I'm, you know, just like be disappointed in myself and my mental, you know, I'm well, as tough, tough as them or strong as them or smart as them, you know, but, you know, I don't know. You got to come at it a different way. You got to learn what you can from them. And uh, fortunately I love both those guys, like genuinely just great people. So um, yeah, I mean, but but there's there's a danger in comparing yourself to that level of excellence and you know being disappointed in yourself when you don't achieve it. So I don't I don't know. Well, I think you know success leaves clues, right? So we're trying to uncover what are the yeah. things that the great ones do. And if you, it's interesting because it, as I as I jump into different sports, right, whether it's UFC, whether it's baseball, PGA golf, women's tie down, calf roping, swimming, like yeah. skeleton in the Olympics success leaves clues. And some of those clues are like control what you can control. Cause there's so many things in competitive sports that you can't control like visualization and mental preparation. If you look at my 10 pillars in that, in that framework, yeah. those are consistent across the board. It doesn't matter what sport, you know? And I think another part of that elite mindset, which athletes have a specific mindset of things like controlling what you can control. But another one is they compete versus compare. Cause if you play the comparison game, you lose all the time. But if you're competing to be the better version of you and you're competing to, can I be 1% better today than I was yesterday and better tomorrow than I am today. And I keep learning and I keep evolving and I keep growing. You can, you can be the best version of you, you know, and you can give yourself that best chance for success, but it doesn't happen when you play the comparison game. Cause I think what, what happens a lot is you start looking at how other people are training. You start looking at what other people are doing and you don't then, trust what you do, you start questioning what you're doing because you're looking too much at what other people do. Instead of, let me look at the sports science. Let me learn about physiology. Let me learn about psychology. Let me talk to people who are doing it at a high level. Let me gather information and then refine my process. So I have a process I can trust instead of yeah. searching all the time. I'll tell you what, I'm impressed, Brian. There's, you know, success leaves clues, uh, uh, compete don't compare there's nothing you don't have a sweet one-liner for you you've got to dive it's in got to be sticky it's got to be, it's gotta be sticky or people don't don't remember yeah you know i, like it. It. I liked it yeah it's it's it's, it's got to be that way in that and that that's what people will take with them right if you say something like don't count the days make the days count well shit that's a yeah. lot that's a lot more sticky way to talk about, Hey man, you got to live in the present moment. And this is yeah. the most important day because it's the one that you have in yesterday's history and yeah, yeah, yeah. mystery, blah, blah, blah. So trying to say things that are sticky, cause I work a lot in college campuses, you know, and, yeah. uh, and to, to be able to get college kids to remember what you're trying to do and make sports psychology, cool, make mental they, performance sticky is, is a challenge. Well, you just, you just ruined it when you said, make it cool. I mean, that was, that was your first mistake, but yeah, you know, b buying some mental real estate from these people that are you know, yeah. dialed in, dialed into whatever, you know, Jamie Sue, whatever, you know, yeah, you know, they got 18 million classes, they got to study this, they got a social life, they got to keep up with whoever's doing what, wherever, you know, um, yeah, it, it's hard to get in people's head today, more, more difficult now than, uh, than it ever was in the future, because you have more things pulling your attention, your focus away. Um, so one of the things I like to do is grab a fighter that I really want to talk to or ask them an information in between a working set. So it seems an odd, like almost counterintuitive, arbitrary, but th this is a time that they are, you know, hopefully focused in on lifting. They don't have their phone on, they're tired, they're whatever. And that's when I'm kind of like, hey, and, and that's when, you, you know, they got a little bit of endorphins kicking from the workout. And that's when you kind of 
can can say something. I feel that you can say something impactful that'll stick with them, and they'll be almost like, you know. And 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 I've had a couple, you know, successful things where I kind of did that and I timed it right and went in, and you know, they were like, hey, you know, I remember when you said, yeah, yeah, that's that's the idea, that's the, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely uh, I'm writing this stuff down. Well, I'm not writing it down, but I'm taking it in mentally. I'll send you the notes that I write down. I know how it works. I'll yeah. take, I take the notes. I'll send them to you so you can study them. Right. Cause, okay. but, you, but you have to get that spaced repetition. I mean, I think that's the key, whether it's why were you good at takedowns? Why were you good at, at punch combinations? Cause you drill yeah. them, you rep them, you practice them. The mental game is no different. If you want to get better at visualization, do it. So much like even now, like when I stand in front of the mitt after the first five or six minutes, it just pops out. Like, I was doing it this morning, messing around, and I don't, I don't train a lot, don't train at all, really. But you know, and I was very happy just to see, pop, 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 pop. Mm. you know, what was supposed to came out came out, mm. and I, or what was supposed to come out came out. I was like, all right, that's 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 that that looked kind of like what's supposed to be happening here. That's good. It's still in there somewhere, you know. So which which let me know that hey, you must have drilled that a lot because mm. I'm you know, and that's another thing. I was never. Well, and I'll tell you something too. The sport sports have changed, especially the UFC. When I was fighting, um, you know, it, it was actually enough to show up and work hard. I just showed up, showed up every time you're supposed to show up, and I worked as hard or harder than anybody else. Now, it, there, there's a lot more mental effort. You you have to not just work physically, but mentally, you have to set yourself up. You have to visualize, you have to think about what you're trying to get at today's practice. And that's not something I ever did even a little bit. Randy was doing it. He was ahead of, uh, you know, he was ahead of his time. But I think now with a sport like MMA or sports in general, there's so much more to it. And I'm, I'm listening to the Kobe's and the LeBron's and the Jordans and what they did. And I'm like, Oh, they were thinking about those reps. They were, they weren't just shooting the ball and hoping that it would go in. They were thinking about everything, every time. They were focused in on their cues, you know, the back of the rim, whatever. The, you know, they they had their five or six things that they were focused on. The, you know, the the way their feet moved on the ground before the left cross, before the you know hook cross hook cr- combo. And there, there's, you know, that that's what I've really come to realize, which you know is a part of sports psychology is so important. Being able to focus in and get your attention on the actual practice for that period of time. Not just, hey, we're here, we're doing this, but this is what we're doing. You know, you're you're cueing, whatever it may be, you know. Um, I won't get too far into it, but that that's really, I think that is the new, that's the new way to train. And and it's it's a lot of work mentally. Like people will always tell you, I was the hardest working guy in the gym. Yes and no. I was mentally not not that hard. I wasn't working that hard mentally. Yeah. I was just, I was just physically pushing real hard. Yeah. My 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 role model was the horse in uh George Orwell's 19 or no, George Orwell's animal farm. His his motto was one in doubt work harder. And he ends up being glue in the glue factory. So that's where I am now. And they'll say, Hey, it's, it's not work harder. It's work smarter when it's both. Right. Yeah, it's and, both. It's Absolutely. Both. and you got to work hard. But I think if you're at that level that you're at working hard is a given, like there's probably not a lot of guys in the UFC that aren't working hard. There might be your couple freaks that have, yeah, yeah, there's talent, a couple. There's no a couple. couple, but, but now, you know, and there was probably more back when you were competing than now, because the sport has evolved so much. I mean, it's yep. come so far in 10 years that, that people grow up now in like when they're young, they're six, seven, eight years old. They want to be, right. UFC, they want to be mixed martial artists and UFC fighters. So they're training all these things and they're playing other sports and they just kind of evolve it. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's so far advanced from where it was in the past, you know, um, the sports science, the training and all that. And I think when you're talking about using sports psychology to improve quality training sessions, it's interesting. My mentor, a guy named Ken Revisa, whose face I have tattooed on my heart, he was like the first real mental performance coach that was working with athletes. He wasn't the sports psychologist writing the research paper. He wasn't doing clinical, which is important, but not what I do or what he did. He was doing, the, the, the performance training. And he would say like early in his career, he goes, people would bring me in to get him ready for the world series, to get him ready for the college bowl game. He goes, what I realized over time was at that point, the hay was in the barn. It was about yeah. getting ready for training, you know? And I think like early, even in my career, if I rewind, I've been doing this for 20 years, I rewind to 2001, 
I would get contacted like, Hey, I got this fight in two weeks. Could you help me mentally prepare? And now I'm like, Hey, I got, you got a fight coming up in eight weeks. Well, contact me when you're not in a fight camp, contact me the month before the camp starts. So we can outline some processes and put some things in place. So when the camp gets here, we have reverse engineered the entire camp from fight day to day one of training. And we have a Google calendar that maps out what days you're training, what your focus is on, where you're training. We've showed it to all your different coaches you're working with. So we've maximized your development because the training that you do on Monday will impact what you do on Wednesday, right? So what are we doing? What is the entire your package look like so that we give you the best chance for success that's yeah that's absolutely that's a little bit what i do on the physical level like how, how do these skills work together how do you you know how do you align your wrestling like what do you need to work on for this fight camp or what do you need to work on in your your you know uh uh a guy i think Bo, i think it's named bo sandoval he i think he's the guy that came up with it we had a cool saying i think it was his 365 day fight camp Mm -hmm. this in-camp nonsense or in-season nonsense like you're a professional athlete you're training every day every day is fight camp you know it's uh you know what what are you improving on what do you yeah and you know it might be only the last eight weeks or when your fight get announced gets announced that you're yeah i'm in camp or i'm mentally gonna but you better have built a base before that as far as your skills as far as your mentality as far as you know, what you're doing mentally, because to, to throw something in in two weeks, yeah, it might be better than nothing. And it might help you for that five minutes you walk out into the arena. But man, you could have gotten a lot more out of it if you've been doing it before practice. You know, you get like 12 practices a week to 15 practices a week. Hmm. If you give yourself five minutes before and after each of those or three minutes, even you, you're going to make some that's a large amount of time. You're going to make some huge strides. Yeah, it's the pre it's the pre-practice routine in the post-practice routine. I talk about an hourglass. Like how do we funnel in to prepare to prepare? Funnel in and make sure I'm present, getting ready to go. I do my training. I journal. What did I learn? What I take out of the training? I hope yes. laying down on the mat, doing some visualization of the training that I just did in the center of this hourglass and basically imprinting it like Randy Couture talked about into what I'm going to be doing when I'm in the fight. You know, so when I'm in that specific fight camp, I might let's say I'm you're you're fighting Rich Franklin, you might see yourself using the technique you're working on that day in practice against rich in the octagon. If you're not in a fight camp, you're just seeing yourself do it in against somebody inside of a cage, yeah. right? So you you have a pre, a pre-practice routine, the post-practice routine, and you're putting together those quality training sessions and stacking those on top of each other, which ultimately then lead to what you're going to do when you're inside the octagon on fight night, hopefully. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great way to summarize it. It's funny. I had the pre-practice routine down, the warm up, the mental prep, what I'm doing, etc. Post-practice, I just went out. <laughs> nothing, nothing. I just transitioned into what I was doing next. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't never gave myself a proper time on the exit on the way out. Mm. Um, and the other thing is too, I would lay out every week. I would lay out what I was going to do in practice, but as that flexed or changed or the techniques were different, I never adjusted. <laughs> You know, I put like the workout I did or maybe like the weight that morning. And I have like just journals and journals and journals of stuff I did. I actually finally threw them away, but I'd had them for years, just like, you know, 10 years of on this weight. I was this. I I lifted legs this amount. I, uh, these are the techniques I worked in jujitsu wrestling. It's pretty hard. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, and, and, you know, one of the it's funny, you know, be making your best, your baseline. Right. And this is something that I picked up from George is he would say when you're always just ready. another, just another, yeah, yeah, I knew, I knew you would grab that one. Yeah. When, you, when you're always ready, you never have to get ready. Right. Like you say, I always want to be ready and stay in shape. And you know, we, the concept of make your best, your baseline, like when you're training all the time, like Bo Sandoval, who actually had a chance to work with him with Michigan lacrosse. So if you see him, tell him I said, hello, I don't know if he'll remember me, or okay. not, but uh, I know Bo from back when he was Michigan days, go blue. But, um, you know, I don't know, the, the make your best your baseline is like if you're always training and then you're ramping up and you're near your fight camps, um, is that like I'll look at myself now and say the worst shape I'm in right now is better than the best shape I was in five years ago. Like my peak shape five, five to 10 years ago, Brian, right now I sit on a normal day in much better shape than I was then because I'm just more consistent with training. I was about to say, what the hell were you doing five years ago? Oh, man? Of course. I'll tell you what. 60 pounds heavier than I am right now, bro. Yeah, well, you know, and that's another thing too. Um, in your line of work, you you can't you can't be overweight. Correct. It just doesn't work. You know, you know, you convince me to change yourself, and you look like that. And that's one thing I 
you know, I, I'll never get fat for that reason. Like I, I'm now I'm just super skinny, which sucks, but it is what it is. Um, you know, for me every day, I'm in the worst shape of my life. Today is the worst shape I've ever been in, in my life, but it's the best shape I'll ever be in, in my life. <laughs> Cause tomorrow I'm going to be just a little bit worse. Hey, I want you to, I want you to go back to something you just said though, and unpack that about how you can't be fat in this line of work. And yeah. I, I agree with that 100%. I remember the day clear as day. My, my advisor at the university of Vermont, where I was a phys ed student, yeah. uh, a guy named Declan Connolly, exercise physiologist, it was, was working with the New York Rangers, a bunch of Olympic organizations. I asked them to come up and speak at a school when I was an athletic director Yeah, <clears throat> and he's in an Irish accent, Mr. Kane, I'll come up there and speak to your school, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to go for a bike ride with me. We're going to ride around that lake up there. And I'm like, shit, I don't even own a bike. So I find a bike. We go for a ride, dude. I don't make it. I make it three miles. And I'm stopped and pull over. And he, he, he turns around, comes back and he goes, Mr. Kane, who's used to always call me, Mr. Kane, you want to work with these UFC fighters? You want to work with these professional athletes? He goes, and you're 240 fucking pounds and you can't even ride your bike three miles. You got a 44 inch waist. Like you're giving your B game to the world. Nobody's going to listen to the fat guy. No one will tell you that, but I'll tell you that because I've been there inside of the locker room and they'll laugh your ass out of there. There's certain people who might not get it. They might listen to you, but what you say when you come walking in the room speaks a lot louder than anything that comes out of your mouth. And that, yeah. that day changed my life. That's, that's really awesome. For me, for me, you know, I look the way I look. There's not much I can do about my body, but, you know, just wear clean clothes, you know? And, and you know, I'm the last thing I'm ever going to be is fashionable, but, I, you know, I just look reasonable. You know, like my, my clothes are clean. I'm, you know, my, my hair is as done as it gets. I'm, I'm to some extent taking care of myself, you know, j- just to like... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, just to be like, yeah, I'm not total slob here. I'm not falling apart. Like I'm not, uh, you know, uh, Chris Farley with the fat guys to give them a, you know, I live in a bad town by the river kids. You got to get your lives together. Uh, so for your younger viewers that have never seen that, check out the YouTube. It's worth a watch. The uh, life coach that's fat and like divorced and yeah, banned by the river on YouTube. We'll put it in the show yeah. notes for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I think that's, I mean, that's, you're a professional athlete. You work around professional athletes. I just think that's, that's the reality that a lot of people don't, will never hear uh, because it may not be politically correct, but to say you have got to be living of what you have to be living, what you're teaching or people aren't going to listen to it. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, you know, we all have a, like a bias when we first meet somebody, that first impression bias, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, I think in society now we've, we've become a lot more resistant to that and that, hey, you know, to realize that that, that may be wrong. But, you know, pe- people often tell me like, oh, I thought you'd be bigger. It's like, yeah, I used to be bigger. I've lost 20 pounds. So I don't lift weights, really. I just can lift with my legs, whatever, you know. Um, but, you know, I'll still like move around. Like I said, I moved around today. and I didn't look horrible. Uh, and, I, you know, that there will come a time when I can't do that, but I will do it as long as I can. And, you know, if, if you're a strength coach or something like that, the other thing about that is what is a better gift to yourself than a workout? Like nothing, nothing. You get up, you get a little something, something done in the morning, you're going to feel better. And so I, I, you know, I ADD, ADHD, whatever I had, it had all the good stuff when I was a kid. And that's one of the things I loved about fighting or originally um, was it's hard not to focus when somebody's punching you in the face or choking your face off, you know? Somebody's trying to kick you in the neck. You, you, it's really like, okay, I'm dialed into this. I'm not thinking about, you know, oh, my gosh, my job's up. My, this is my girlfriend. Is bad. You know, I'm not thinking about all these life stressors, you know, or the 17 things that are randomly rolling through my head about the lint on the mat or something, you know? Like, I'm thinking about this guy's trying to punch me. I need to move. I got to pick a direction and go. What do I counter them with? You know, and that, that's one of the things I loved about the sport. And then I always encourage kids with, uh, you know, the ADHD to get into wrestling, you know, because once somebody just starts grabbing on you, you're like, oh, I I've, I've just I've seen a lot of kids. They dial in. You know, it's a very real thing, you know, with the, with the ADHD and all that. So you, you uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just a cool thing. So anyway, work out. It's, it's your gift to yourself, right? It's an hour of your time a day. It's, you know, one hour a day, it's just my time. And that's, that's awesome. You a morning workout guy, evening workout guy, when you do it? Try to, usually if I do it, it's in the morning, you know, uh, 
and I just, you know, I have a little, I don't get over five like you psychos, but you know, I, you know, I, I try to set it into my day. So, so a lot of times I won't even turn my phone on before I work out. Yeah. You know? cause, Cause then you're, then you get blown up and you open up Pandora's box and you start getting, well, and then you're like, Oh God, God well, I mean, unless I have to, unless, you know, it, I'm expecting something, then I'll open it up and deal with what I have to deal with. And then just, you know, just a little something, get the heart up, get the blood going, you know, it's not, you know, my workouts aren't super difficult or intense anymore, but they're enough to, to create some endorphins and make me tired. And, you know, not, a, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure you've worked out some days where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm mentally drained the rest of the day. Right. So there's, there's a happy medium in that, but I think physical exercise is just super important for everyone. Yeah. I like the, here's another one for you for us. I like to call it sweat before screens. Right, is get up and work out. Uh, <laughs> work out in the morning yeah, before you get in front of the TV, laptop. He's got, phone. He's got it all. Because, <laughs> because what happens though, man, is like you sit down at the laptop or you get on the phone, and next thing you know, social media, text message, email, phone calls, boom. And next thing I know, it's been an hour and a half, and there goes my workout time. In my days, I'm better performing. I'm a yeah. better husband. I'm a better coach. Every aspect of my life is better when I sweat before screens and work out first thing in the morning. And when I can, I can't always because of the nature of the job. When I can, I turn my phone off a couple hours before bed. Now, I can't do that because I also work with a team um, in Shanghai, China. So, like, my middle of the night is there wide open. So, I got to, like, check, unfortunately. But that that's just another piece of advice. You know, shut it down three hours before bed. Shut it. Don't eat three hours before bed. Don't look at your phone, like, if you can, you know. Why do you say don't eat three hours before bed? Uh, there's no reason. It's just good for you. It's good to fast over the night. Three hours before bed, you, you, you're supposed to really, you can eat for two things, what you just did or what you're about to do. Hmm. You're about to sleep. You don't really need food. Yeah, I mean, unless you're that. really like trying to get some, uh, you know, gain, uh, casein protein in and really maintain some muscle and you're just terrified. But yeah, yeah I, I think, uh, you know, just uh, you're, if you sleep for eight hours or seven hours and you fast for the three before you you're getting a reasonable fast every day. Yeah, I like to call it eating on the odds. Take that one to the bank too for us, where I'll have my first meal 7 a.m., last meal is at 7 p.m., and then I get that 12-hour break in between. I'll go every odd hour. Like when I was a when I went from 240 to 180, I basically took my took about 2,000 calories a day. I went into a calorie kind of deficit, and then I would eat 7, 9, 11, 1, 3, 5, 7. And I never got really hungry because I was I always knew the next the next fuel source was coming. So that was funny. You asked me why, why, why do you do that? But you do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I do the same thing. Yeah, I do. I do what I found. And I, I know I wear, I wear a whoop strap and I wear a garment yeah. watch and I track sleep scores. And I found that when I eat two hours or more, but I try to get my last bit of food down at least two hours before bed. I find I sleep yeah. a lot better. I get my, my flash fluid down two to three hours before bed. So I'm not waking up, going to the bathroom during the night. I try to have a caffeine curfew of noon so that I'm, cause if I have it later in the day, like yesterday, my whoop score did not register sleep because I did not sleep because I was laying in bed all night excited for this podcast, but it was really because I drank a bang at like 7 p.m. Yeah. Well, that's crazy talk. So for me, uh, two o'clock is a hard, 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 hard out on caffeine, two o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So 155 hits and you're on it. <laughs> no, no, I, get that last, get that last drop. Get that could, yeah. But then you get, you get into a cycle, right? Where then it's like, okay, I get the, I, I make a mistake because I have to do it because I have to perform or something's going on. I hit the caffeine late. I don't sleep. And then the next day I'm a zombie during the day. So I'm you hitting the caffeine during the day. And at some point, at some point, you just got to suck it up and go into turbo mode and go, okay, I'm going to have to grind through this at some point with no caffeine to get me back into the normal sleep cycle. You know? Yeah. And I mean, if you're a real stud, you can do a little physical activity, just like a four minute Tabata of jump squats or something hard and wake yourself up. You can pull shower. We have an ice tub at work. Sometimes I'm getting that yeah. before like a late, I didn't tonight. I didn't have time. Um, but, but I'll get into the, the ice tub sometimes. And, you know, that's a similar endorphins to caffeine, you know, your catecholamines or whatever they are, they're going to be, they're going to be kicking you. You're going to wake up a bit. You get in that suck for a couple minutes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Big fan of the cold tub for us. Hey, want to be respectful of your time here, man. I appreciate you joining us on the mental well, performance hey, Astros I, podcast. I want to thank you for giving me this hour of free uh, therapy. I want to thank you. I've got a lot out of it. I don't know if I caught all the, the catchphrases, but yeah. no, it's been great to speak to you. Again, I'm a fan of your work. Keep up the good work and thank you much. 
And um, can you edit this to make me sound really smart? That would be great. Yeah, I, and we'll uh, we'll keep the cat on the on the keyboard. We'll we'll yep. make sure that we feature your daughter walking in and out. And then yep. last question that we had was, uh, what are you growing behind you there, buddy? Um, well, hey, you know, I got to be honest. It's uh, marijuana is legal in Las Vegas, but I'm not growing it because I don't know how. These are my wife's plants. I don't know what they are even. And the, just, they make her happy, so I make sure that they're happy. The the green the the craft room slash greenhouse at the Griffin House. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Awesome, Forrest. I appreciate right. being with us here, man. For people that want to engage with you, they want to follow you. What's the best place for them to get you? Is it on Instagram? Is it on Twitter? What's the best place yeah, for our listeners? Um, to I think it's it's uh, www at leave me alone. No, I I'm, I'm on the socials at Forrest Griffin. You know, yeah, I'm around there somewhere. Awesome. Forrest, thanks for being with us, man. I appreciate you hopping on. All right. Much appreciated. Thank you. Special thanks to Forrest Griffin for joining us on the Mental Performance Mastery Podcast. Wherever it is that you are listening to this, I'd love for you to leave us a review. It helps in the podcast rankings, helps us get our message out there. And I'd love to learn more about what you're getting out of these great podcasts with our guests. So please leave a review. Also, make sure you check out my short form daily podcast, The Mental Performance Daily. It's where I share strategies, stories, tips, and techniques that you can use immediately in three to five minutes a day. You can check out that short form Mental Performance Daily podcast. I'll make sure I put a link in the notes here as well. Thanks for being with us. Dominate the day. Dominate the day.